chapter 2447 reads, the figure shows an infinitely wide conductor parallel to and distance D from an infinitely wide plane of charge with surface charge density eta. I personally use the symbol sigma for charge density. What are the electric fields E1 to E4 in regions one to four? So let's go ahead and start with an image. So we have a very big slab, a conducting slab. This is our conductor. Now I'm going to assume that this conductor is neutrally charged. What this means is it has an equal number of positive and negative charges. Now a certain distance away from this infinitely large conductor is an infinite, and actually let's do some perspective here. Just drawing it to try and make it look a little more 3D. We also have an infinitely big plane of charge. The plane of charge is a distance d away from the conductor. Well, what do we know about the electric field due to an infinite plane of charge? Anyone know? Okay, well, if you're not sure, I definitely talk about it in a video on symmetry, but I'm going to remind you, remind you here. Due to an infinite plane of uniform charge, the electric field is uniform. So the electric field is going to point, uh, point away from that sheet of charge. And for now, I'm going to temporarily get rid of our conductor. to focus on the electric field. So we have an infinitely long sheet of chart, charge. Being infinitely long will establish an electric field that is uniform. What that means is the electric field is constant it has a constant orientation and it has a constant magnitude in the space around it. Now this uniform sheet of charge, the book says it has surface charge density eta, but you'll see in my videos, I use this, the symbol sigma to represent surface charge density. So just for now, for you, we'll define that as charge per unit area is how a surface charge density is defined. If this is a uniform charge, then it will be the amount of charge in a given area. Now it doesn't tell us if this is a positive or negative charge density. So I'll just assume positive for now. Here is our uniform electric field. Okay, so we have a uniform electric field. Let's look at what happens when we put a conductor in that uniform electric field. So if this conductor were initially neutrally charged, what will happen when placed in the electric field, the electric field will produce polarization inside the conductor. So that means it'll cause charge separation. So negative charges are attracted to positive charges. They will move opposite the direction of the electric field lines. Positive charges are repelled by other positive charges. So what you'll have is when you place this conductor in the electric field, you will end up with charge polarization in the electric field where the inner surface will be negative 
and the or the surface closer to the conducting plane will be negative. The surface further away from the conducting plane will be positive. Now here's the thing. There can be zero electric field in a conductor in electrostatic equilibrium. Let me say that again, and, and I'll actually write it down. So we will say for conductors in electrostatic equilibrium, The electric field inside them is zero. Okay, so, so let's talk about what we mean by electrostatic equilibrium. So what electrostatic equilibrium is, it is the case in which charges are not moving. So we have stationary charges. That's the static part. The equilibrium part is, comes from physics 4A those static charges are in mechanical equilibrium. What that means is this. They are not moving. And the net force on each charge is equal to zero. When that happens, we are in electrostatic equilibrium. And when we are in electrostatic equilibrium, there can, there can be no electric field inside the structure of a conductor. Now, when we popped this conductor into this electric field, for a few moments, the charges were separating. As the charges are moving to separate, it's not in electrostatic equilibrium they are responding to an electric field. But once they separate, they arrange themselves in such a way that the electric field inside them ends up being zero. Now here, this, isn't, this probably doesn't quite exactly represent what's going on, but here I'll just draw some arrows looking at the electric field lines that that charge separation establishes. So those charges are separating, but you can kind of get the sense from this picture visually at least that there's going to be some cancellation of electric field lines there because you have that external electric field causing a separation of charge, which means the charges inside will establish their own electric fields, and they will rearrange themselves until there is no electric field inside the conductor. So I'm going to redraw this now indicating that scenario. This is assuming that enough time has passed that the um, that we are in electrostatic equilibrium. So we still have all of these. That's the electric field of our infinite sheet of charge. And we still have this. It's just that inside, the electric field is zero. Here's another way of rationalizing that the electric field inside is zero. Remember, if a charge, and let's just look at a positive charge. 
remember, if a charge is in an electric field, it will experience an electric force. A positive charge will experience an electric force that is in the direction of the electric field given by QE if that positive charge is indicated as Q. And this is the electric force on the positive charge. While the negative charge, here let's put a positive here, while the negative charge will experience an electric force opposite the direction of the electric field. So this negative charge will experience a force going down that causes the charge separation. If those are the only forces on the charges, we can't say these charges are in equilibrium because they will accelerate in the direction of the net force. They are not in equilibrium if they are accelerating. So for our picture here, when we are saying the charges are in equilibrium, that guarantees there cannot be an electric field by the condition, because if there were an electric field, the charges would be moving. So let's see if we could prove how, or we could determine how much charge is on the inner surface. Well, actually, let's do a couple of things. Let's see. I'm, I'm just rereading the question so I can make sure that um, I could hit the conceptual points. Give me just a moment. Okay, I actually kind of feel like I've given enough to answer the question, but I want to do more. I want to, um, I want to do a little bit more. So the question says, what are the electric fields in various regions? So they call this region one above the, the, the conductor. Region two is in the conductor. You, are, you should already know the answer for that because I wrote two right next to the answer. Region three and region four. Well, you should know that um, region two, the electric field inside that conductor should be zero. And in one of the lecture videos, we, we determined the electric field due to an infinite plane of charge. So you should have an expression for that as well, the electric field due to an infinite plane of charge. And that should be the values that we get for, um, for the different, different regions, except you might have to think about what it would look like in region one versus region four. And my open question to you, and I'm not going to answer it yet because there's more things I want to do. I want you to think about it. But my open question to you would be, would the electric field in regions one, three, and four all be the same in magnitude? Or would there be some, some differences? And if so, how could you use Gauss's law to find the differences? So I'm going to leave that as an open question, but the next thing I'm about to do might help you with that. So problem 47 involved an infinite sheet of charge and a conducting slab. And if you wanted to prove for yourself the various results or what values for the electric field that you would get at various regions, consider creating Gaussian surfaces for those various regions. So consider creating uh, this being planar symmetry, you would consider creating Gaussian boxes that enclose your charges for each of the regions. Do one for region one. Do one for region two, though you should know the result conceptually for region two. Do one for region three. 
and and uh, see what you get. Okay, take care, everyone.